ask that you move by your spirit, Lord God, in this sanctuary, in the name of Jesus. Move by your spirit over the airways, God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father God, oh God, can't do anything without you. Oh God, need you, Lord God, to pull out this morning in the name of Jesus. Father God, as I begin to open my mouth in Jesus' name, open up heaven, God, pouring out, Lord. Let it be a two-way exchange, Lord God, pouring out in the sanctuary in the name of Jesus, pouring out over the airways, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Father God, you know the need in the house, God. You know the need over the airways, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Use me, Lord God, for your glory, God, to supply the need, God, in the name of Jesus. For you said in your word, God, that if I be lifted up, that I will draw all men unto me. Father God, I stand, God, and I decrease, Lord God, and I lift you up, Lord God. You do the drawing, Lord God. You know the need, Lord God. You get the glory, you get the honor, God, in the name of Jesus. And Father God, we thank you, we praise you, Lord God. Oh God, circumcise the ears that they may hear clearly what your spirit is saying unto their spirit, in the name of Jesus. And Father God, we thank you, we praise you, that when we pray, Lord God, that you hear and you answer. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Tabernacle Ministry. Glory be to God. Faith Tabernacle is located I-45 Neyland Street. We're in the Houston, Texas area. Our zip code is 77022. Our motto here at Faith Tabernacle is where the just shall live by faith. The pastor here is Pastor Debbie Ann Reynolds. Glory to God. If you would like to donate to the ministry, our cash app is dollar sign FTC Houston. If you have a prayer request. Glory be to God. You can send it to the email address here at Faith Tabernacle, which is ftchouston at gmail.com. Glory to God. Good morning. I am Minister Beverly Smith, and I am here to minister the word of God to you this morning for our Sunday school. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord. Go with me. Glory to God to 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, the ninth chapter. Glory to God. And I do believe that this is an end time season word. I got so many confirmations when I was just meditating on it. God was just sending confirmations, you know, go in that vein, go in that vein. Glory be to God. I always tell people, I said, this time of year, this season is not a happy season for a lot of people. Glory be to God. And it's definitely not a happy season for me. Glory be to God. But I thank be to God. Because it's not by my strength, nor by his might, but it's only by the spirit of the true and living God that I'm able to make it through this season and that you're going to be able to make it through this season. Glory to God. Second Samuel, ninth chapter, verses 1 through 4. I'm reading from the King James Version of the Bible. Please pray along with me and pray for me. And it reads as follow. And David said, is there yet any that is left in the household of Saul, that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was of the household of Saul, a servant whose name was Zeba. And when they call him unto David, the king said unto him, art thou Zeba? He, and he said, thou servant is he. And the king said, is there not yet any of the household of Saul that I may show kindness of of God unto him. And Zabah said unto King Jonathan, and said unto King Jonathan, yet have a son, which, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, where is he? And Zabah said unto the king, behold, he is in the house of Macro, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. We're going to use as a topic this morning, when life circumstances drops us down in Lodabar. When life circumstances drops us down in Lodabar. Now, Lodabar was considered as a place such as a place, the very meaning mean not having, no pasture. It was a town of forgotten people. In Lodabar, we would find unskilled people, uneducated people, outcasts from society. When I began to meditate on this and think about it, 
bringing it to this present day time, Lodabar would be considered a SICU unit in the hospital. SIC unit is where everybody there is in comas, fighting for their lives. Lodabar would be considered as when we drive through the Acres home area and you see the people on the corners all gathered together, drinking, getting high, that is considered as a Lodabar area. Lodabar would be considered as a diagnose of cancer. It takes you, these are places that takes you deep down. Okay, takes you deep down. It says that it was a place of no pasture, a place that was unproductive, a place where you could not plant and get a return, a place where you look over to the left, that person is crippled and lame like you. You look over to the right, the person may be in a worse shape than you. It's a place where you could not pull life from. Glory be to God. A deep, dark place where there's no life. You turn around, you can feed on anybody. You couldn't get help from anybody because you were all in the same condition. You needed help. You needed life. You needed something to happen, glory be to God, that was more than what you were seeing. Loaded bar could be considered as a generational curse. When you look in your family, you look around, nobody's serving God. You see addiction. You see murder, you see molestation, you see imprisonment, you see no life outside of what you're surrounded by. That can be considered as a loader bar. Being addicted is a loader bar. It is a place that is non-productive. You can't produce any life outside of loader bar. Let's look at the backdrop of the story. Here, glory be to God, Methuselah's father was Saul, was Jonathan, and his grandfather was Saul, the first king of Israel. The boy was only five years old when his father, his grandfather, and all his uncles were killed in battle on Mount Geboa. They were all killed at the same time. You can find this in 2 Samuel, the fourth chapter, starting at the fourth verse. When Mephizosheth nurse heard of the news, she grabbed the boy up in her arms and she ran in a panic. And in her haste, she dropped Mephizosheth and he became crippled and lame in both feet for the rest of his life. For all the rest of his life. Now, in the Bible, the reason why the nurse done this is because in the Bible, whenever a king in a kingdom was killed, they always look for all the members of the family that could possibly be successors that would threaten the new king's reign on the throne. So that means everybody that was related to that king in that kingdom that was an heir, that could possibly be an heir or inherit that throne. They had to get rid of it. No threat. No threat whatsoever. It makes me think about when Achan, thank you, Holy Ghost, stole the golden wedge. And when they found out that he stole the golden wedge, how they brought him and his family out and opened up the ground and swallowed the whole entire family, the cattle, everything that was associated with Achan. My first thought was, I said, that's not fair because they didn't steal the golden wedge. He did. So why don't they just kill him? Why is it the wife, the children, and all the animals had to die, had to suffer for what one man done? But as I began to grow and learn in the word of God, not a Bible scholar, that that spirit would be in that family. He was the head of the household. And so that spirit was somewhere in that family. So in other words, for that not to happen again, when they go into battle, 
They had to get rid of that spirit. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ that we don't have to suffer the mistakes that our ancestors have made with the generational curses that have happened. Just think, if Jesus hadn't came on the scene, glory be to God, the things that our ancestors, our forefathers had done, we would be suffering those things. Matter of fact, it probably wouldn't be no humans here on earth. It wouldn't be none the visitation. Because like the scripture said, him without sin, let him cast the first stone. So we thank God for Jesus. Glory be to God. When life circumstances drops us down into Lodabar. As I researched and I was reading through that little backdrop, because I didn't want to go through the whole story and, you know, bring it up to this present day for the sake of time. The Holy Ghost showed me four things in that backdrop that we can learn from, that, that can encourage our heart, that can bless us in this season. Because like I said, it's, it's not a good time for a lot of people if we be true about it. The first thing that the Holy Spirit showed me, he's the teacher. He's the orchestrator. He's the administrator. Glory be to God. He's our helper in times like this. The first thing that I saw that he showed me is it happened when you were young in years or young in your spiritual walk with God, a baby Christian, or it is happening right now. A lot of people are suffering some things right now. Spiritual misfits. Because Lodabar was a place where the misfits went. And a lot of people are spiritually misfit right now in their spirit because of life circumstances have dropped them off have dropped them down into a deep place when you get negative reports they drop you down onto a deep place doctor standing on the side of the bed said there's nothing else that we can do you know call the family in get your house in order that drops you down to a low place Glory be to God. You're trying to process what's really going on, what's really happening. Mephizah's Jeff was only five years old when he was dropped. Only five. Glory be to God. A young child. Matter of fact, we can call him a baby when he was dropped. So when you think about it, because the Bible doesn't say, you know, how he wind up in Lodabar. The Bible don't even say, you know, who cared for him until he became an adult. All we know is that he wind up in Lodabar. You know, and I couldn't help but think as I'm reading and I'm studying, you know, who nourished him? You know, who helped him? Because he was only a baby. Five years old, he couldn't get a job. You know, he couldn't do anything for himself. You know, who took him there? Did the nurse continuously, you know, care for him until he became an adult? That's a long time because after he was dropped, we didn't hear anything else about him in the Bible until this time, until he, he was an adult. So it was a long time in between that the Bible don't talk about with Mephizoshev. So I have to say to you, you know, when we go through some things, sometimes, we could have been prophesied to, you know, and, and the prophet come and say great things, you know, God is going to bless, you know, God is going to heal, you know, God is going to restore, God is going to exonerate, you know, God is going to do. And, you know, when they speak it, they're speaking life to you, but then you don't have a time. Ain't nothing like having a time. You know, in, in the space in between the prophecy, you know, and, and, and that line, that dash in the middle, sometimes it's a long time. And it can take you to Lodabar. Glory be to God. It can take you deep down. You know, because you're, you're like, so much is happening around me. And I remember what was prophesied to me, we may even write down the date, the time, the person who prophesied it, the scripture, the verse, everything that was said. But time makes a big difference. 
it makes a big difference because we are the kind of people we want the here and the now. We want the here and the now. That's why they have microwaves. Let's get it done quickly. When my grandmother was living and the microwaves first came on the scene, the first thing she said, don't bring that one of them things in my house. She said, don't bring it in my house. I heard it had that radiation that you get in your body. No, it don't work like that. I don't want that. Ain't nothing like something slow cooked. So we couldn't buy her no microwave. You couldn't even buy her a remote for the TV. Y'all children get up and change that channel. She didn't, she, she didn't want all of that stuff. That was too much for her. That was too quick for her. She liked the old way of doing things. So we had to abide by that. But when time, when there's some time in between, you will get discouraged. You will lose heart. You will faint. You will lose hope. You won't believe. Although we know that God don't speak outside of his word. You know, every word in God is yea and amen. But, but you can, you, we're human. So you lose heart. So for everybody where it has been a lot of time in between, and God knows I know what I'm talking about because there have been some times, and it's still yet some time, a lengthy process, and I'm still waiting. But I don't want to lose heart, and I don't want to lose hope. And I'm so grateful to God that every time I get to the place of Lodabar, and I want to lose heart, and I want to lose hope, I want to get bitter, I want to throw in the towel, I want to get out of it, that God will sin. A word of life. He'll send a word of life. Second Peter 3, 8 and 9. And this is for all of us. What, what, that's a lot of time been in between what was spoken. It said, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. And sometimes we can be ignorant because we get tired. We're human. That one day with the Lord is as a thousand years in a thousand years as, as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. When I got through reading that, the Holy Spirit said, repent your way out of Lodabar. Repent your way out of Lodabar. Because Revelations 12 and 10 says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. See, when life drops you off in Lodabar, you don't say what God say. You say what you see. Because you're in a dark place. Okay? No, it shouldn't be. But when you're in Lodabar and this is all you see is negativity, you say what you see. You don't say what God say. And see, one thing about the enemy, he don't, don't, he, he don't pull no punches. He don't feel sorry for you. So he meets you right there in Lodabar where you are. I ain't no good. You, you're right. You ain't no good. God can't use me. You're right. God can't use you. Look what you've done. You're in a backslidden state. Yeah, you're right. See, he's agreeing. you agreeing. Y'all having a conversation. You're not aware. You know, he's telling you you're worthless. You're not of any value. You know, God can't use you because of what you've done. You know, you're from an unskilled family. Oh, you've been in between the sheets. That ain't your husband. You're right. He don't pull no punches. He don't like you. Yeah. And when you're in low the bar, sometimes your mind is so messed up, you ain't got sense enough to know you don't like him either. Yeah. But you can't think straight. That's why the scripture said, be not ignorant. Be not ignorant. Because that spirit of ignorancy has overtaken you when you're in low the bar. Yeah. But that is not God's will. That is not God's will for my life, your life, or anybody's life. 
That's under the sound of my voice on the YouTube channel. That's not his will. That's not what God say. Let's look at this thing some more. When life circumstances drop, you in low the bar. And see, a drop is something that's unexpected. It's unexpected. It's not something that's planned. Nobody planned to be dropped off in low the bar. You know, we as humans, we love to take trips. We love to go places. You know, we love to see a different scenery. You know, we love to breathe the fresh air. We need an out. But if I was to have some tickets and say, okay, everybody, the bus is on the way, it's coming. Who want to go with me to load a bar? Y'all look at me like I'm crazy. She lost her mind. I ain't going to no load a bar. Now, if I had not told you and you didn't know, it's a trip. And it's a free trip. And we're going to stop and get something to eat on the way to load a bar. The trip is on me. Everything free. If you didn't know what Loader Bar was all about, y'all be out there. Let's go. We're going with, with Minister Beverly to Loader Bar. Don't even know what Loader Bar is. Okay? Until you get there, you be like, Lord, what in the world? Maybe this is a prayer warrior's mission she done brought us on. Because God knows when you walk into Loader Bar, some prayer is needed, some deliverance is needed. Because one thing about it, when you get in an area like Loader Bar, you feel the negative spirit. You feel what's needed. And that's why you need other people with you to pray. That's why when Jesus sent the disciples out, he sent them two by two. Because some missions that you go on, one person can't do it. One person can't do it. One person cannot do it. Even in our families, although we can be familiar with our families and familiar with those family spirits and things that are going on in the family, one person can't do it. When you're in a house full of demons and every demon in there is against you and they know what you used to do and what you used to be, so they're not receptive of the prayer that's going forth. Because they're so busy thinking about what you used to do and what you used to be and who she thinks she is and who he thinks they is trying to pray for somebody. All the stuff they used to do and they used to be. Don't respect the anointing in your life. So you can't, you can't get no deliverance there. But somebody else come along may have been just as wretched and worse than they was but because they don't know the history of that person, they will be receptive. And that's okay. Because the most important thing is you want that soul saved. You don't care how God do it or who he used to do it. Just do it. Because they need it. Because it's needed. So when you're disrespected by your family and your anointing is disrespected, it's okay. That young person says, I. Right. Because, see, God's process is not our process. Okay? God don't do the thing the way that we think it should be done or how we think it should be done. But he does it. When life circumstances drop you down into Loda Bar, number two, a great loss, a tragedy, an event caused great suffering, destruction and distress such as a serious crime, a natural catastrophic. Now we know we just seen that. We just slowly coming out of that COVID thing. That was a catastrophic thing. Okay? That was a great loss. One day you're talking to the person. Next day they in ICU. Next day they gone. And it had a rippling effect to it. <laughs> Glory be to God. It had a rippling effect to it. Can you imagine a five-year-old Mephibosheth, five years old, you done lost your daddy, your grandpa, and all your uncles. So how you know about your heritage? Who told you about your heritage? Who was there for you? Think about it. Think about it. I remember and I always like to use me because I don't want nobody to think I'm talking about them. I can put me on display. 
Okay? Because y'all can't get mad at me about me. And if you do something wrong with you. Okay? I can remember when I went through my divorce with Harry. And then in the midst of me going through my divorce, my oldest son got incarcerated. And I was so, you talking about in low the bar. I was so depressed. And my baby boy, Devontae, I'll never forget, would sit here in the ministry and he would lay his head on me because he was eight years old, young. And I remember the late, great Pastor Eric Reynolds called me to his office and he told me, he said, sister, he said, I noticed your reaction, he said, with your son. Because I would, you know, get off of me. He said, he has suffered a great loss. He has lost two major people in his life. You know, and I'm like, well, what about me? Why I got to carry the load? The load is heavy. And I'm tired of carrying the heavy load. It's not fair to me. It's not fair. Yeah, he's hurting, but I'm hurting too because I got a lot I got to figure out that I don't want to figure out, that I don't want to do. I don't want to be a single parent again. That was never in my plans. Am I making sense to anybody in here? So that was a heavy load. You know, but he began to pray for me and talk to me. And the tears began to flow because that was a great loss. Now, I can't even imagine for a five-year-old, Mephizoshev, you ain't got no daddy. You ain't got no grandfather. You ain't got no uncles. So how do you learn to be that mighty man of God when you have nobody pouring into you? You have nobody sowing into you. You have nobody, glory be to God, to tell you about your inheritance, to talk to you and tell you about your strength, you know, to develop you. Thank you, Holy Ghost, to develop you. It makes a big difference. A great loss, a tragic, it makes a big difference. A big difference. I look at the ministries that have lost the men and women of God on the front line. That's tragic for the body of Christ. That was a tragic thing. That was devastating. Glory to God. I imagine some ministries lost some people, you know, and it, they left because they felt that, you know, that anointing was, wasn't there anymore. But I thank be to God that, you know, here at Faith Tabernacle that we stood strong and we held on. You know, he said we cried and we slunk snot. But we came on in the house. Hurting, yes. devastated, yes. overwhelmed, trying to process it. Yes. Is it really real? Yes. At some point, I would be sitting, you know, out in the pews, waiting for Pastor Reynolds to pop out. I said, ah, ha, because he loved to joke and tease. But it didn't happen, y'all. It didn't happen. It was real. It was real. Yes. So we had to walk with it. The things that we had been taught and we had learned, yes. walk hurting. Yes. Glory be to God. My physicist lost his father, his grandfather, and his uncles all in battle on Mount Gilboa at one time. No time to process it. No time. Have you ever been in one of them kind of situations? No time to process it. I'm trying to process what's going on. I'm trying to, but so much stuff has happened. I can't even get this process out before I even get this. Glory to God. I, I, I laugh at myself because when I have to do my granny nanny duty for my daughter, that's what I call it, granny nanny, and I walk into her house, my grandson, because I'm there with the boys, because Naya is no longer there. She's in college, and CJ will say, Granny, you going to cook? And I tell myself, look, I can't cook. I got to process why I'm here, how long I'm going to be here, how I really want to deal with y'all. So today would not be the cooking day. I'll give you a meal, one meal before I leave here, but not, not today. Please take granny bags up to now your room because today is the day of process. So y'all have to deal with whatever your mama left into the kitchen. 
until I get me together. Because it's, it's, it's different for me. See, at my house, I ain't got to eat. <laughs> I ain't got to cook. You know, I ain't got to do that. So they, they, they know. The first day there, don't ask me about no food. Don't ask me. Okay? Because I'm processing my granny nanny duty. Now, when you've been hit hard with a tragedy, like we was hit hard with this COVID-19, and this thing had this rippling effect. If you was from my era, meaning my age range, and a lot of y'all probably don't even know, and I ain't going to call them no names, but it'll have you in Loda Bar singing a song. Ain't no love in the heart of the city. See, that's blues. Ain't no love in the heart of town. Ain't no love in the show is a pity. Come on now. Ain't no love since you ain't around. See, he was singing about a woman. But see, when you go to Loda Bar, it have you singing like that because you don't see Jesus. Because when you look around, it ain't no, you, you don't see no love. Because of the crippling effect of what you're surrounded by, glory be to God, and you don't see nobody you can draw life from. Everybody is in the same identical situation. Okay? We get ready to go off into the holiday season. A lot of people have lost a lot of loved ones the first time, first year of my divorce. I didn't even want Christmas and holiday seasons to come. If I could have stopped it, I would have stopped it. Because when the song say Christmas just ain't Christmas without the one you love, see, that's what Lodabar would have you singing. But what you fail to understand is not the natural person, but it's the love of God. Let's go to scripture. Psalms 34 and 19 says, many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us out of them all. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. Nobody want to be afflicted. And you sure don't want many afflictions. Bad enough for one, but you don't want many. I think if I had learned the meaning of that scripture before I said yes to ministry, I'd be like, uh-uh. You know, tell me how many. One affliction, but many? So that means a whole lot. Ongoing. How often do I have to deal with these afflictions? You know, what is my rest period in between? And the most importantly, what is the affliction? Let me pick it. Makes sense. But see, when you, life circumstances take you to low the bar, you got to remember God said it. And if God said it, then it's so. And if he said he's going to deliver, he's going to deliver. Number three, when life circumstances takes us to load a bar. And when I say us, because everybody, God has no respect to person. Everybody, everybody is going to have a load a bar experience. Either you just coming out, you get ready to go in, or you in it right now. But you will get it. You will get it. Number three, an unintentionally drop that causes our life to change forever. No fault of your own. It ain't my fault. It is not my fault. It's not fair that I got to suffer this. It's not my fault. When I said yes to Jesus... The enemy came all out the cracks in the walls. Up from the floor. From the ceiling. I was just overwhelmed. To the point where I had to ask Pastor Deb, I said, look, did I move out of season? She say, you right where God wants you. Can't be. Can't be. Too much happening. I thought this way was going to be easy you know a hallelujah to just you know I, I I I was in the closet I had a I had a closet ministry and 
I was praying in the closet. And my closet was right by Janae's bedroom, right, right where her where her bed was. And I was up, I think it was 12 midnight or one o'clock in the morning. I'm just crying, just praying and crying and just crying out to God in the spirit. The next day, bam, 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 bam on the wall. Janae, hey, we trying to sleep. You saw you building a house. Trust me, I, I was. I was building a house. She said, all I can hear is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Load of boy make a cack. We can laugh about it now, but trust me, when you're in it, it ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. And see, when I learned, when the man of God, the late great pastor Eric Reynolds said, learn how to pray in the spirit so the enemy will not come and take your prayers. I said, I got to learn. I got to learn. I got to learn that. However it come out, I got to learn it. Because I'm studying praying and the enemy is saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. You ain't praying in tongues. Shut up, shut up. Uh-uh. Whatever. Get me there. God answer. I need you to strengthen me. I need you to encourage me. I need you to enlighten me. I need you to remove the scales off of my blinded eyes. I need to know how to do this thing. To honor you. To magnify you. To glorify you. If I'm a break, let me break behind the walls. Don't let me break in public. Because somebody is attached to me and they're feeding off of me. And they need life out of me. I don't want them to see me down here in Lodabar crippled all up and they're crippled all up and they can't draw anything from me and I can't draw anything from them. If they draw life all out of me, let me break behind the walls, not in the front. Glory be to God. The unintentional drop. What do you do? What do you do? When the person is trusted to take care of you, the person that is trusted to nurture you, the person that is trusted with your life drops you. There are some people that have been dropped intentionally. Intentionally. And you ask yourself, why is it I didn't get a good mama? Why is it I didn't get a good daddy? See, I used to ask that, why, why I didn't get a good daddy? You know, what, what did I do wrong? Why I didn't get a good daddy? I would love to see young ladies being nurtured by their fathers. But see, I didn't get that. And so that was always a question in my spirit. You know, they took me to Lodabar. Why didn't I get a daddy that loves me? Why? And I can remember when I started working at the district and I was a clerk and I was working in the pediatric clinic in uh, the PD emergency room. And the girls came over from the adult emergency room. And they said, hey, is this old drunk man over there? Girl, he asking for you. He said, he your daddy. I said, what's his name? He said it was Smith O'Neill or something. I said, yeah, that's my daddy. Well, yeah, that's my daddy. So I went over to the emergency room, cutting up, clowning. Cause see, alcoholic drugs. I went over there. He told everybody in there, y'all, I'm the head nurse. I ain't the head of nothing. <laughs> but that desk I was working at, at the time, working three to 11 shifts. So I told him, I said, look, I'm not a nurse. You mean tell you ain't a nurse? Long you been working here, you ain't a nurse. I said it's not based on the length of time you've been working at a place. I don't have the education. I'm not a nurse. I didn't go to school. Oh, what you do here? I said doesn't make any difference. What is it you need? What you need? These people over here they want feed them. I said okay. I'm gonna make sure you get everything you need. I said but I need you to do this for me. First of all, I need you to be good. And I need you to stop clowning and cussing people out over here and stop telling them that I'm a nurse. I said, but you will get everything that you need. I said, before I leave work, I will come and check on you. I said, can you do that for me? I said, because if you don't, you know, these people over here, they can put you in a room where won't nobody know you there. You know, 
You won't die, but you'll probably wish you was dead. So just be nice. Okay. All right, baby. I'm, I'm, I said, just do that. So I went up to the desk. I let him know that it's my father. Everybody knew me. I had been there for a while. You know, get him something to eat. You know, do he have any allergies? Not that I'm aware of. You can check with him on that, but get him something. You know, and I'll be back before I get off, you know, to check on him. I'm not paying his bill. No money will, 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 will deal with this transaction. I know his gold card is not up to date, but I'll do the best I can to help him get one. We have a 30-day lax in between. But as of now, feed him, you know. All right. So, see, load a bar. I could have easily said I don't know who that is and I went. Because I didn't get what I wanted in the father or what I thought I should have gotten in the father. Okay? Because, see, God has a process for the fatherless and for the motherless. And it's a great process. You were birthed for a reason. Okay? You were birthed for a reason. So when a person that's entrusted to take care of you drops you unintentionally or intentionally, know that God has a great plan for your life. Know this. When life circumstances serve you, a load of bar experience, notice number one. A, the love of God. The love of God. Jeremiah 31 and 3 says that the Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you with the everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And if you notice that sometimes we can be so ugly and so bad. And God could just love us to life. See, so you don't have to tell a person what they are when they're a sinner or what they're bound by and what they're addicted by. You ain't got to tell them that they already know. But when you come to them and you don't even address what they are and how they are bound and you just love on them, that convicts. That make them cry because they don't understand it. Because, see, in their loader bar world, they're loveless, unlovable. And they think God don't love them and God is not going to listen to them. That's why we have so many people to come to us and say, would you pray for me? Because they feel like that they're just so dirty and so bad that they can't go before God for themselves. So they think that we like this with God. Not knowing that I'll have fallen short of the glory of God. We mess up too. But the difference between us and them is we know how to get it right. Because the scripture said, just man falls seven times. What let him know he's just, he get back up. And he get it right. But see, they don't know that. Okay? B, we are intentionally made. We're intentionally made. Regardless of what you think about yourself, you were intentionally made. God then didn't make you with, oops, uh-oh. Wrong leg, wrong eye, wrong ear, wrong nose, wrong foot. Oops, got to go back. No, intentionally. The scripture says in Psalms 139 and 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. Whatever circumstance life is serving us right now, know this. Jeremiah 29 and 11 that we know so well. God said, I know, I know what I think about you. And I hear what you think about you in this load of ball experience. But that's not what I think about you. That's what you think about you, but that's not what I say about you. He said, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Said the Lord, thou of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Expect the future, a great future. Yes. But it's just something about when you go to load a bar, it'll take you out. Now, load a bar, I told you life circumstances drop you down to load a bar. That's a place where the misfits are. Okay. And when you're in a place where there's a bunch of misfits and you can't 
See, it will have you to count yourself out. It would have you saying stuff about you that God don't say about you. It will have you looking at you, calling you crippled. Although Mephizah's feet were crippled and he could see that he was crippled, you know, this is what he called himself. You know, crippled. You know, the blind was calling themselves blind. The hopeless, no hope, no help. Whatever the physical being was at that time, that's what they were calling themselves. Diagnosed with cancer. The first thing the enemy tell you when you're diagnosed with cancer is you're going to die. When, when, when now God has given men so much knowledge, so much knowledge, whose report will you believe? You know, you, you have people that you would consider being low to bar when you have to walk through a hospice center. And that's when the hands are up with the doctors and we can't do anything else for you. So many people that walked out of hospice, lead a doctor standing there scratching their head. Trying to feel what, 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 what in the world? Whose report will you believe? I choose to believe the report of the Lord. The fourth and final, because I told you it was four things that the Holy Spirit showed me about Lodabar. We need people in our life when we're in Lodabar with the spirit of David. Remember I told you, I said, David asked. He inquired. He said, is there anybody left in the household of Saul that I can be kind to? Now, evidently, somebody had told Mephizah something because this servant that was Saul's servant that was still alive, he knew that Jonathan's son, Mephizah was alive. He knew where he was. You know, he could have easily maybe sold him out. But he never said anything until he was asked, if you notice. So it was five years old when it happened. So all this time, this servant had held on to this. Had held it and kept it away from King David that he was serving. So that lets you know that's a wise man. So you ain't always got to go running your mouth and talking. Because he could have been, you know, the kind of person that say, you know, maybe I'm going to get some extra points from the king. I'm going to tell him because this person is left, you know, and he could be heir through the, to the throne. But if I go and let the king know, he can go and get rid of him. He ain't got to worry about him being no threat to the throne. And it didn't make no difference about his feet being crippled. That didn't have anything to do with it. You know, he still could be heir to the throne. But because of the relationship with David and Jonathan, because Saul, you know, he was jealous of King David. But because of the relationship with Jonathan, his son, which was heir, heir to the throne. But Jonathan wasn't concerned with that. See, God will put people in your life, glory be to God, that is kingdom people. That's heir to some things. Okay, but it's not that they disrespect the things that they're heir to, but they have so much of love in their heart for you. So they're willing to release what they're heir to, to you. And God blesses. So when he asked him the question, he said, is anybody left? Anybody left? Mephizah thought that you know, when they were bringing him up to King David, that, that he was going to get rid of him, that he was going to kill him. Not knowing that all the years he had lived down there in Lodabar, in that, in that deep, dark situation, no hope, no help, you know, can't get any better in the midst of misfit that God had a blessing for him. So what am I saying? Those Lodabar experiences is a process. To prepare for a great blessing. We got to go through some things in order to know how to handle what God is getting ready to give us. I mean, David just gave it to him. It was his father's, his grandfather. He, he gave it all to him. And then told him, you can eat at my table. He gave him the land. He gave him the servants. And told him, you can eat at my table. 
You're always welcome. So see that loader bar experience. Glory be to God that, that, that you're in right now facing or having a situation. You know, you know your loader bar experience. It's a blessing in it. But because of the loader bar experiences, you'll know how to respect it and you'll know how to handle it. You'll know how to share it and you'll know who to share it with. Because when God give and when he bless, he don't do it for not or for you to hold on to it. Now, Joel 2 and 25 and 26 says that, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the plumber worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that had dealt wonderfully with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Now, there were years in between my physical chef drop and when he came into the blessing. Now, give you my testimony and then I'm going to get out of Yahweh. I told you this time of season. It's a load of bar time for me. A dark time. Because of family situation and everything. But because of God, he knows who to use. He knows who's in tune with him. He knows who can hear. He know my thoughts. He know my ways. He know what I want to do. He know what I don't want to do. He know when I'm giving up. But he always have somebody there for me to bring me back to life and to pluck me up and pull me out of Loda Bar. It was a great gift that was given to me. I'm not going to share what the gift was. But it was a desire of my heart and it was a great gift. But it wasn't the gift. It was the words on the card that pulled me up. And the word said many times, strong people get looked over. Not considered for the blessing. Because the assumption is that they are okay. And that they got it all together. But I want you to know that this is a deliberate blessing for you. A strong woman. That told me up. Because I've always been considered as the strength in my household. When things happen in my family, it's always bad. 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 Nobody never ever considers the fact that Bab get weak. Bab get tired. Bab need help. It's always, she got it. And for some reason, I, I, I don't know where people get it from. They think that when you have years of service on your job, it automatically make you rich or have money. They just don't know. They really don't understand. So I say this to you, just like the card was given to me and the gift was given to me, and the person just don't realize, I was in a loader bar state in a dark place. So when I read the card, it just busted me upside my head and tears was rolling, but it strengthened me and it confirmed, you're in the vein. You're in the vein. Because if it happened for you, it's for somebody else too. So I pray that this message has been a blessing and have plucked somebody up out of Loda Bar to let them know God sees, he knows. Just like David was, was looking, you know, for somebody to bless, looking for somebody in a household of Saul, you know, to be kind to. God is looking for you. He's going to be kind to you this holiday season. He's going to bust you upside your head with an unexpected blessing, a deliberate blessing. And don't worry about what you did. Don't worry about what you said. Because the God that we serve, unconditional love. He said, I don't put no conditions on that. That's why my son Jesus had to die for you. Because I knew you were going to do that. I know you're going to act a fool. I know you're going to get ignorant sometimes, but it's okay. It's okay. You're human. You're human. So I pray that this message has been a blessing 
to someone. Glory be to God. To our YouTube listeners, we thank you. This is Faith Tabernacle Ministry. Faith Tabernacle is located I-45 Neyland Street, Houston, Texas. Our zip is 77022. Our motto here at Faith Tabernacle is whether just you live by faith. The pastor here is Pastor Darian Reynolds. If you would like to donate to this ministry, our cash app is dollar sign FTC Houston. If you have a prayer request or if this message has been a blessing to you, please send us an email, ftchouston at gmail.com. Be blessed and we love you. Glory to God. Amen.